Yeah, so thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So this is uh, a compressed version of uh, the lectures that I have given here and there uh, in machine learning. And uh, I focus on high energy physics at the end, but I want to go through a few basic concepts uh, uh, that I think uh, allow everybody to be on the same page. So my slides, as you will see, are full of text because they are meant for offline consumption. I, I over the years, have noted that this helps uh, students uh, when they want to go over what has been shown at the lecture. But this also makes it harder for you to focus on what I actually say during the lecture. So. Uh, please, please try to focus on what I say rather than what is written on the slide. Okay, so uh, that's that's uh, that's what I ask you if you can manage. Uh, there's way too much material uh, in what I would like to cover, so we will skip uh, many things. Uh, well, I already pruned the material. This was originally a six hours lecture, so <laughs> but there are some 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 slides that I won't go over, but you can still uh, look at them offline or ask me questions offline. Okay. Um, so a couple of suggested reading for you if you haven't uh, had the chance to go over the the basics of uh, machine learning in general. Uh, these two books I think are very interesting and useful. The first one is also available online for free. So and it's a 800 page book that uh, will contain mostly everything that you can ever possibly know. But of course there are advanced techniques that have come up uh, in the meantime and. Uh, and uh, so one needs to keep one's eye open on, 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 on what comes up in the literature. I should also mention that there's a living review of machine learning for high energy physics that uh, kept updated by Ben Nachman on the archive. And you should, um, it's on GitHub, but you can access from archive. You should look at it. Uh, ben Nachman is the guy. Um, that's very useful. Uh, so these slides are in part uh, based on a lot of material from other speakers and uh, okay. So uh, I will introduce the topic by, by, well, I'll give you a broad overview, but I'll touch on density estimation, which is at the core of what we do when we do classification, for instance. And uh, and okay, and then we will uh, indeed look at uh, at uh, how you can define the loss of a classification or regression problem, and how this is equivalent in some cases to a maximum likelihood uh, uh, formulation. And then we we'll look quickly at decision trees, and then we will go at high energy physics applications, and uh, well, we'll touch on neural networks, and then we will look at uh, how these can be used for our problems in a few cases. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, I decided not to go through a detailed look at all of the applications because uh, you can do that by yourself if you already are a practitioner in high energy physics. Rather, I will concentrate on a couple of examples that give uh, most of uh, most of the things uh, highlight what what we need to take care and uh, be aware of. Okay. So um, as an introduction. Machine learning is everywhere, in artificial intelligence, if you want. Uh, you, these two terms are a little bit interchangeable. Um, we can see uh, ma machines mastering in closed systems like Go and chess. Uh, we have uh, automated language translation. We, can, we have uh, systems that interact with you and answer questions. We have uh, self-driving vehicles. Uh, um, image reconstruction and uh, understanding. Machines show some understanding already of what's, uh, what's uh, displayed in pictures. So all of these advancements are brought forward by, by what was uh, were originally a few statistical learning methods. But we, are, we have found that that way to progress towards artificial intelligence. The path was long uh, and winding road. Uh, it started uh, with a few science fiction writers in the end of the 19th century, but then it was formalized mathematically by a few great minds like Alan Turing, who also devised the test that uh, 
that uh, that uh, would allow you to define uh, when uh, we reach when a machine reaches uh, human level intelligence because you cannot tell uh, it apart from a human being when you interact with it. Uh, there was a, a, a landmark conference in 1966 where actually the term uh, artificial intelligence was coined, uh, and uh, there were many developments then and a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning and a lot of funding from the defense budget uh, that kept this going. But then uh, uh, the research efforts were damp and uh, there, were, there was a winter, uh, no funding uh, and discouragement. And uh, after uh, some, some, some enthusiasm with expert systems in the 80s, uh, there was uh, another dampening of activities. But then the way towards uh, research uh, and increased research in artificial intelligence has come from finding solutions to closed systems. Uh, there was uh, finally a machine that defeated the world chess champion and uh, the development of neural networks uh, coupled with, of course, uh, a much, much cheaper and uh, faster CPUs. So now towards, we are, we are going towards a general artificial intelligence, uh, which is something that is capable, not only a master in closed systems, but applying and generalizing intelligence to uh, uh, all the problems that it, is, uh, that it is confronted with. Now, whether this is desirable or, desirable or not is, 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 is a difficult question. Once we create the superintelligence, uh, uh, this uh, will largely make us uh, disposable. So we have to be careful. There are a couple of books here that you might want to read. So there are interesting times ahead. I think uh, we are far from an artificial general intelligence, but it may take 20 or 30 or 40 years, but it will happen, okay? And this will be a paradigm change in a number of ways. So, and we define machine learning. I don't want to spend our time this way, but uh, I want to make a point that, uh, okay, we have to define what learning is, and you can define uh, define it in many different ways, but, but there is in general the point that learning involves adapting your response to stimuli with a, with, via a continuous inference. And this is done by comparing new data to data that you already processed and know about. And this process is called uh, the analogy, creating analogies. So uh, analogies are the building blocks of our learning proce process. And interestingly, uh, be even before we start to use analogy for inference or guesswork, we have to classify unknown elements in their equivalence class so that you can find the similarities, okay? So in this sense, classification really is more fundamental in our learning process than even, even than analogy or it's a key ingredient in building analogies. And classification, uh, and not by chance, is, is really uh, what allowed uh, lots of uh, uh, breakthroughs in, in science, okay? So you know about this. So it is an important point that we want to, an element uh, in the road to artificial general intelligence and something that we use a lot also in high energy physics. Um, also, it is at the heart of our decision-making process, okay? So, well, enough of the, about, about these generalities, but, uh, but uh, you got the point, I think. So, when we talk about machine learning, or I, I still like to call it uh, statistical learning uh, in many domains, except in the most advanced uh, developments, uh, you can, div you can divide this into supervised, semi-supervised, and unsupervised. And uh, this depends on knowing the probability density of the classes uh, that you are trying to discriminate. For instance, if you're doing a signal versus background classification. So the, the conditional probabilities, right? And uh, you, you can, this means that uh, you have examples of these uh, uh, classes that are labeled by uh, being signal or by being background. And so you can actually learn their densities and uh, be able to classify elements, uh, unseen elements, unlabeled elements in their equivalence class. And you can sometimes do this even when you only have a partial label, partial labels uh, for, for your training data. 
But if you don't, then you are in a very interesting regime, which is actually at the core of the most recent developments, the unsupervised learning tasks, where we lack an a priori notion of the structure of the data. And we allow the algorithm to uh, autonomously discover it, okay? And there are a number of uh, subfields, cluster analysis, anomaly detection, which is very important for us, okay? So I will have, if we have time, a few examples of this. And okay, there are other areas of research uh, that involve reinforcement learning when you want to a machine to learn to, to walk by itself, like this uh, automaton here, which of course is a computer simulation, but it can, it can be shown that it can learn by trial and failure. But okay, let's concentrate on this. Basically, I will be talking about these two classes. So here is a map that uh, clarifies uh, uh, all of these various uh, flavors of machine learning. And uh, I, I made this sketch, uh, which is kind of vague because, okay, anomaly detection is typically unsupervised, but uh, you can inform it and partially, uh, partial data no labels knowledge. And uh, density estimation is at the core also of supervised learning in a sense, but per se is an unsupervised learning task, if you want. And uh, then classification and regression are basically the same thing, but the output class uh, may be a digital or a continuous, uh, continuous number. So uh, for the supervised learning problem, the starting point is a vector of measurements, okay? So this can be uh, variables that you measure, that you extract from. And, and, and then you have some training data uh, that uh, have a, a certain value of a variable and then an output class. So you, these are labeled events. So the outcome, the, the response, the target, if you want, that you want to classify elements into, uh, maybe a, a, a discrete variable, so y equals zero or one, if uh, the two classes are uh, signal and background, for instance. Um, in regression, y is a continuous value. So you want to find the top quark mass, uh, that is a continuous value. And you have some estimators of the top quark mass that you have computed, maybe a single variable like a, like a, like a, a kinematically fitted top mass from your inputs, or it may be a number of observable quantities per each event. And you want to regress and find the most likely value of the top mass. So this is, this is a continuous output and it's a regression problem. Okay, so the, the objective is to predict uh, a number for uh, which uh, is representative uh, of, of Y given a certain example, okay? Um, and this doesn't, doesn't belong to the training set. So you in principle have no access to the true value of Y. What you want is that your prediction uh, it is this function of the input data, uh, the features of the, of the example you want to classify or regress to, uh, must be close to the, to the, to the true value, in fact. Um, and we would like to also, uh, as a side topic, understand what features are the most important that, uh, that, that give us more power in, in determining the class or the value that we regress to. So this is the typical problem that we have. While in supervi unsupervised learning, the starting point is also uh, a certain number of measurements and, uh, and you can have training data, but you, you don't know the labels for this data. So you have some data and uh, and you, you, you want to let your algorithm find structure in a sense. And so the objective is much fuzzier. Uh, so you want to clusterize events in, in, in populations that appear to have different properties. So like in analogy, you are building different, uh, different, uh, different classes, but you do this uh, bottom up, okay? And uh, it's hard to find uh, a way to, to really determine how well the algorithm is doing because you don't uh, classify, you don't, you didn't even 
define an objective uh, uh, in a very rigorous way. But results can actually be very useful as a pre-processing step, for instance, for supervised learning tasks. So for instance, you can give your data to an unsupervised uh, learning machine and uh, the machine will find the interesting regions of the data of the face space uh, of the feature space of the data that says, look, there is an accumulation of events in this area, which, uh, which is uh, quite unlike the rest of the data. So then you can actually focus on these events and, uh, and study them in a different way. This is an anomaly detection task, for instance. Um, in principle, the problem is easy. Uh, take a regression problem uh, and take uh, the, the prediction you want to make uh, for, for, the, for the variable y based on the input is given, can be given, for instance, by the average of the y's when the x have the value that you want. So this is the conditional expectation. So uh, you make an average and this has good properties because it can be demonstrated that uh, it typically has uh, the minimum uh, average squared error, your, your, your prediction f of x. But this is not necessarily what you want to use. There may be other metrics that you want to minimize uh, for instance, uh, you might want to minimize the absolute value of the difference between your prediction and the true value of y. What should you use, for instance, uh, why should you want to use this? this? This, for instance, this is a question for you, but okay, we don't have time to go through, through this. So this is, this is, this is when, uh, what you choose if you want to minimize the average absolute value is the median value of the y's given the x. Okay, so you realize that uh, depending on what you want uh, really to to optimize on what your what your what your objective is, uh, you you can uh, have different definitions from your from your the, the the way you your test statistic what you construct with your data. Um, if uh, you, you want a discrete uh, output, so a class label, for instance, uh, uh, what you can do is to compute the probability that y is that class uh, given the data. Okay, and, this, uh, and if you have a multi-class uh, problem, then you can take uh, the, 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 the class which gives the highest probability, the majority vote, okay? And, so does this solve our problem? It does, but uh, the problem is in general that uh, uh, we do not have access to, all, to these, uh, to these uh, conditional probabilities. So uh, this, is, this is what is basically said uh, in, this, uh, in this slide. The problem is that we have sparse training data that are obtained by a forward simulation. So there is a, there is a, there is a, the possibility for us to simulate events at the particle collider and uh, go through a simulation of uh, hadronization and uh, the case and uh, reconstruction and uh, in your detector. But we cannot determine the probability of observing a given event kind. Uh, um, uh, sorry, the probability of some uh, uh, latent space. Uh, so what is the probability that, uh, that this uh, event uh, is given by a certain, uh, um, a certain physical process? Because the same physical process will give rise to different uh, kinds of observations. So it's a stochastic process that allows you uh, no inversion of the problem. So, what are you going to do in this problem is uh, uh, typically you rely on density estimation methods. So we are going to touch on this, OK? Uh, so uh, given some data, you, you want to determine the prior, OK? So we are typically interested in many cases of interest for energy physics in obtaining the density of the data on an interesting variable, such as the mass of the of a particle that you can reconstruct. Uh, you can do this uh, with parametric approaches or non-parametric ones. So a parametric approach is just uh, trying to find the functional form that describes your data well. A good 
continuous model. Okay, and uh, this requires some assumptions, and uh, it's a simplification. And uh, you know, all models are wrong, so you have to accept the fact that uh, this is an approximate solution. Okay. But you can also try to approach the problem with non-parametric means. So you use uh, uh, sample-based estimators, the most common of which is the histogram. So you, you create a histogram of, uh, of, uh, of your, uh, with your data, and, uh, and this is by itself a, a, a density in a certain the variable that you want to, to study. But it is discretized in a sense, and it has a meaning. But this uh, has uh, many useful properties. For instance, in particle physics, we are typically interested to know, uh, so you, you, you observe a mass, the, the mass of a resonance, and you want to determine properties of these events, but you have some background on top of the resonance. And what we can do is that if we have a histogram, we can actually look at events in the peak region and subtract events in the sideband region, which because these are a good representation of the background under the peak. And, uh, and, 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 and if that is the case, you can look at any other variable, not the mass, but any other variable you want to study for this process. And uh, by doing subtraction of the sidebands, you get the density of the signal. So you see this is a density estimation also for other variables than the ones that you are actually accessing directly, as in this case. So histograms are invaluable for this purpose. Uh, they can also be used for efficiency estimates. Uh, uh, so we use them a lot, right? Um, in general, uh, in statistics, they I think they're called the empirical density estimate. And uh, the most, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, obtained by placing a Dirac delta function at the location of every uh, example that you have in your, in your uh, simulated data, for instance. And so you make an average of that, and that is your empirical density estimate. This is rarely useful in practice as a computational tool because of the discontinuity, of course, but it, it, it can be very useful for visualization. Okay? As I said, the histogram is, uh, is very valuable, but uh, it, it must be understood to be a, uh, a, a, uh, a regularized uh, version of. So what, what I'm saying is that because uh, the bean width is uh, uh, finite, you uh, do not have access to the real density that is a continuous function of whatever variable x you're studying. Uh, it is beamed, so you put uh, all the events that have uh, a certain value of x in a certain region in the same bean. And so you are losing information on the uh, fine structure of the density, okay? So, um, they also are discontinuous, which may create some problems uh, when you're doing differentiable uh, stuff like uh, gradient descent um, or stuff like that, but okay. So, but they still are very useful, okay? And then you can generalize these two grams uh, uh, with kernels by, for instance, substituting each event uh, with a certain function, um, like a Gaussian distribution, and then you create, uh, you create a continuous model. I won't go through these formulas, but they are there for your reference. Okay, um, so this is uh, this is going a little bit towards uh, having a continuous model, and it may be useful. And there are even uh, more uh, in particle physics. We have used uh, even more advanced uh, kernelization techniques, uh, uh, such using uh, different kernels for different data points. For instance, this is a plot of the top mass versus the W mass reconstructed from simulated events uh, after some kinematical fit. And you know that a kinematic fit uh, will uh, use, uh, this was uh, an old plot from the CDF experiment at the Tevatron, uh, which was the experiment that discovered the top quark, and you know the top decays into a W boson, so you can dis determine separately the top and the W mass for events that you reconstruct. And then 
you may have a different value of the uncertainty of the top mass from in the W mass from different events, because different events may have different properties and the kinematical fit may return different uh, uncertainties for these uh, fitted variables. So you can substitute in this time two dimensional template, a different uh, uh, kernel function for events that have different widths uh, on the top mass and on the W mass and different correlation between the two variables, which you get from the covariance matrix. So you get by summing up these kernels, a two-dimensional density, which is, as you see, not, uh, not a single simple ellipse, but it is a much more complex structure, which reflects much better the properties of these two variables for the simulated data. And then it allows you to do a better inference uh, once you look at uh, real data, okay? So I, I've talked too much about ideograms, so let's move to, uh, multi-dimension. So you have seen two-dimensional application, but in fact, uh, we are working with multiple dimensions. So uh, one thing that we can do in multiple dimensions to estimate the density is to take a few events in a small region around the point where you want to estimate the density and count, for instance, how many events of one class, uh, the blue or the red class in this case, so signal and background, and uh, do the average of the density locally. So this is, this is uh, called the K nearest neighbor, where K is the number of examples that you take in this ball that you inflate around the, the, the green star here. Uh, so uh, th this is a very, very useful concept in statistical learning. And, um, and uh, okay, you typically have to standardize your features such that uh, because they typically come in different units, so you divide by their standard deviation, and then you have variables that behave similarly, that have the same scale in a sense, so, so that you can create uh, balls in n dimensions that have the same the same radius in all directions, uh, and then you can uh, do these estimates more carefully. Okay. Uh, so this is this is the distance where which you use to construct the close event to find the close elements to, to the point of space where you want to estimate the density. Um, and okay, you realize that there's a number of things that you want to optimize here. Um, you want to optimize the k because if you have a small number of elements in the ball, the average of uh, of the density in the local point of space is, uh, is subjected to high variance. Uh, but if you enlarge the K and you get a larger ball, then you get a better variance because you have more examples. Uh, it's scaled with square root of A of K, in fact, but you get a bias because you are averaging out events that have a different density because they are in a different point of space. Um, so you can also do things, uh, more fancy things, uh, construct hyper ellipsoids instead of hyperboles in this multidimensional space so that uh, you, you, you don't look at events far away in a direction where the density is changing a lot while you allow yourself to look far away in directions where the density is not changing. So you have to look at the gradient of the density to do that. Uh, there are two problems with the KNN algorithm that uh, uh, it is CPU expensive because uh, you use all of your training data for each point of feature space that you want to estimate the density of. Uh, and they are, are, are subjected by the course of dimensionality, which is basically um, the problem that you have limited amount of training data. So here is it. Uh, so in this graph, what you see is the fraction of the volume of the feature space that you are um, uh, that you are uh, uh, basically that you are investing uh, uh, depending on the number of uh, dimensions that you are looking at. So wh what this means is that if if you if you create a, 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 a ball that, uh, that has a certain small fraction of the volume, so imagine that you have a thousand events, 
and you want uh, 50 events in a ball, that, that means that uh, in a, if, they, if they are uniformly filling the space, uh, the volume fraction of the ball will be 5%. And, uh, and if you are going in, in this, if this is a high dimensionality problem, uh, the size of this ball will basically be almost the full size of the space. That means to say that these balls are not interpreting the locality of the density any longer. They are looking at the full space. So you rapidly lose uh, sensitivity to the, to, the, to the real position where you want to estimate the density. Or if you want, you acquire a bias, okay? Because you're not looking at what you want to estimate. So high energy physics analysis often have uh, many important variables uh, that you want to do a density estimation on. So uh, the KNN uh, has limited use as a generative algorithm for density ev evaluation, but you can always apply dimensionality reduction techniques and then get back to a situation where you have a manageable number of dimensions. Let's look a little, very, very little bit at, uh, at resampling techniques that are very important uh, um, as a tool, a generic tool for a number of things. Um, well, they are very useful for hypothesis testing of which you have heard from Aris on this morning. Uh, but here we are more interested about the estimation of bias and variance. Uh, and this is, uh, this is what we use them typically for. And we also use them for cross-validation purposes uh, when we want to estimate uh, the accuracy of our predictors that we construct in machine learning, okay? And the, this resampling allows you to avoid assumptions about uh, the, your model because you are constructing effectively a non-parametric model from the data, so you are you're safe. Okay. Um, so I, I'll just mention what the bootstrap here is because we don't have time. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is uh, this is what uh, what permutation sampling is. I won't go into that. The bootstrap uh, is, uh, is uh, motivated by obtaining an estimate of the variance of an estimator constructing on some data X. And we do this by generating a number of replicas of the data set by repeatedly picking a subset of the observations at random from the set. We replacement, that is if we take, uh, if we have taken an, an example, we can take the example again uh, multiple times. And then we can estimate the, 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 the test statistic and the, the estimator. Uh, we can construct the estimator a number of times and then construct an average of them and also the standard deviation of it. So you get for free an estimate of the variance of your estimator without any assumption on the real distribution. Okay. Um, yeah, here I have an example uh, of, uh, of uh, how the bootstrap was used in a real analysis. Uh, this was an analysis of uh, Dye Higgs production in the four big quarks final states in 2017. And we used the bootstrap to evaluate the properties of, uh, of, uh, of our uh, model. So in this particular problem, we have four jets in the final state uh, uh, and uh, the Monte Carlo is hard uh, to, uh, you don't have enough Monte Carlo and the Monte Carlo uh, also doesn't model this process in the background very, very well. So you want to create a model, a multidimensional model of the data from the data themselves. So how you do, we did this was to create, to, to, to uh, a method called the hemisphere mixing. So we cut events in two, uh, and take uh, each half of the event uh, and uh, mix, uh, mix the results. So the procedure we adopted was uh, uh, to, uh, to take events that have jets and you see these blue arrows are jets in the transverse plane X and Y. So we are looking at the beam in the, in getting into the, into the sheet here. And we, these events are characterized by a thrust axis. That is the, 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 the axis where most of the momentum flows. And you can get this from the jets in the event. And then you can cut the event in two orthogonally to the trust axis. 
And then you can uh, you get these half events that uh, basically decompose the problem because you 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 have uh, you have hemispheres. You don't have uh, events any longer. So maybe there's a Higgs boson if it's a signal events. Maybe not. But uh, but if it's a QCD event, you have basically taken this as a, a representation of a two hard gluons emitting in different uh, hemispheres and then hadronizing uh, independently. And you can put these two events, uh, two half events uh, in a library, okay? And you create a library with all your data events, but it's a library of hemispheres, not of full events, which you can then recombine because, uh, uh, because uh, you, you can, for any event uh, that you want to model in the real data, it's the same, it can be the same data set. You can again find the trust axis, find the hemispheres, and then look in this library and identify two elements that are similar in topolo topology of the jets to the ones of the events that you want to model. And therefore, here you are doing uh, this with what is uh, a K nearest neighbor. Uh, because you, are, you, you have to have similarity in this uh, abstract space, and then you can use the, 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 the events, the, the half events in the library to construct an artificial event that models your original event. So you do this uh, by uh, similarity in this, uh, uh, in this space uh, with a, a nearest neighbor distance, and these are number of jets, number of B tags, uh, and uh, other things. So this procedure creates an artificial data set that has multidimensional features that are the same as the original data set, but it is not the original data set. It's a little bit of a bootstrap with half events, if you want, constructed by using this KNN. And you see the model of uh, the BDT output. So you can use this uh, artificial data set to, uh, for a model of the QCD background uh, because uh, if there were Higgs events inside, uh, by creating hemispheres and mixing them together, you basically reduce this fraction uh, uh, to zero. You, uh, you become insensitive to the minority component because of the mixing. And then you can construct uh, a, 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 a multidimensional classifier, and you see that uh, the model uh, works very well in approximating the density. Um, so, and then you also apply bootstrapping uh, here to create replicas of the, uh, of the original data, and you can compare and extract biases and correct for the biases. So you can do a number of good things. So the bootstrap really gives you access to um, uh, in-data modeling, uh, and uh, you don't rely on the Monte Carlo. So it's very useful for us in, in cases where we don't trust our models, okay? Uh, I won't talk about jackknife uh, resampling, uh, but uh, the slide is here. A couple of words about the model. We were saying that we don't trust our models sometimes, but our simulations are typically pretty good. Um, but in general, for any, 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 any applications, you need to build a model. So you need to understand the structure of your data, and you need to know what you really want to do with it so that the, the answer and the most uh, promising approach will depend on what you want to do. Um, if you have a low-dimensional regression task that you want to solve, you might they rely to parametric functions, which you might actually find uh, they give a good uh, representation, okay? But in a complex classification task, uh, uh, you will want to use a much more complicated model, for instance. We'll touch on deep neural networks later. And the model will, uh, the, the method that you use will learn the model parameters, be it uh, parametric or non-parametric. In a parametric model, you will have maybe five parameters. In a, in a deep neural network, you will have a million parameters, okay? And these parameters will allow you to make predictions uh, on previously unseen data. So here is uh, just a slide that says this in other, in other pictorial ways, but uh, let's move on, okay? So uh, I organized this lecture in three parts uh, and uh, machine learning, uh, this is the end of the first part. So um, 
so I have a few takeaway bits uh, here, but uh, okay, we can just uh, which uh, can just move on. So let's look uh, more specifically at the uh, classification. Um, can I ask uh, um, the moderator uh, how much time, uh, or or I can see it here? Okay, so I'm more or less uh, in my schedule, so it's ten forty three here. Good. So binary classification. So signal and background are uh, are 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 the catchwords for us. We can we want to see the signal, so we want to discriminate it from a background, and therefore. And therefore, uh, you do classification, binary classification. So generally, we typically know the characteristics of the classes of events because we have uh, forward simulations uh, that allow us to do so. And we want to define a decision boundary that allows us to say, this is signal and this is background, okay? Much like hypothesis testing, but in this case, uh, you extract uh, what you want to do uh, after after having defined the critical region here. So you can have a rectangular rule in two variables. These are two features of the data, for instance, and you decide that uh, the background is most uh, likely at the low variable values of X1 and X2. And this gives you a good uh, discrimination, but uh, you will do some mistakes in some cases, okay? You could have a linear rule, which will also do very poorly in some regions of phase space. In fact, these are two linear rules, if you want. So I should have put this uh, before the other. Uh, and then you can have no linear rules uh, that, uh, that, uh, that allow you to exploit uh, more fine features of the data. And they, they will still have uh, some uh, mistakes, uh, but they will be smaller. So, uh, the difference between these methods is that uh, these are more stable in the sense that uh, uh, they, they, are, they are less uh, affected by the vagaries of your data because I remind you these uh, red and blue points are just a representation of the data. They are not a generalized model of the density. And while uh, no linear rules will be more affected, for instance, if they are highly complex, like a neural network might, uh, might create a boundary of this kind, they will have high variance, but they will typically do a better job and have a smaller bias. This trade-off of variance and bias is ubiquitous in uh, statistical practice, and it is here as well. So, what we base our, our inference on is the feature space. Uh, we have variables that define uh, the examples so from signal and background here in red and blue. And then you have, uh, and you have all these, uh, these variables uh, that you want to create uh, a test statistic with, a function of the data that reduces the dimensionality because uh, it is a one dimensional uh, feature. So you want to compress the information, okay? And then you can construct, uh, again, a density estimation and a histogram of the resulting values of the, of the test statistic for signal and background. And there you have uh, your possibility of selecting a signal-rich region, okay? So how well are you doing? Well, you can construct some estimators. The receiver output characteristic curves is a summary of where you're doing with your estimated uh, test statistic. And it tells you how much signal you, you, you how much background you throw away when you, when you cut harder and harder on this test statistic. So here is uh, the area, the, the rock curve. This is basically uh, the integral from a certain value to one of the, of the two densities for signal and background. And they are, uh, so for any point here, you will have a certain uh, integral of the C on the signal and a certain integral of the background. And there you can put a point in this, in this curve. So you will create a curve and this curve will have a one efficiency one if you are not cutting, but uh, then you have no rejection for the background. And as you decrease the efficiency, you increase also the discrimination power. So you decrease the number of background events that you retain. So you want to be as far, uh, as far in this direction as you can to be more pure uh, and uh, have a high sig signal efficiency. But of course, the two conflicting uh, criteria 
force you to live on this curve. And different curves will have different uh, area under the curve because they, these two curves, in fact, may have say, the similar area under, underneath themselves. Uh, and so a, a criterion uh, is actually that uh, gives you a total view of how well you're doing is the total integral of this curve, which is called area under the curve, of course. Uh, but uh, this is a general criterion, but if you really want uh, to have the maximum signal efficiency at a certain value of background efficiency, then you don't need the area under the curve. You just need these two points here to decide. So it is not trivial, in fact, to decide which, which classifier is best if you have a choice of several ones. So the area under the curve is just one of the criteria. The area under the curve has a nice statistical interpretation also, because if you take two events at random from uh, the signal and from the background, the area under the uh, rock curve is actually the probability that the signal events has a higher score than the background event. Okay, so, um, but there are a number of possibilities that uh, go beyond this. When you're doing uh, the a separation of signal and background uh, the, and creating a test statistic for this, there is one lemma that is very important by Neyman and Pearson's that tells you that uh, if they are, your hypotheses are simple, so that is, uh, they don't depend on external parameters. So for instance, you have, you're trying to discriminate the top quark from backgrounds and uh, you are not concerned with the value of the top quark big mass because by now the top quark has been determined very precisely. You are doing a simple versus simple um, uh, discrimination because the mass is well-defined. But in the times of CDF, when the mass of the top quark was not yet defined, you had a multiple possible densities for the signal uh, density because uh, you didn't know the top quark mass. So this was not a simple versus simple uh, hypothesis testing or discrimination problem. And then you could not use the Neyman Pearson's lemma. But for simple hypothesis testing, where these are just uh, uh, top and QCD, for instance, you can use the ratio of the of the densities, uh, and uh, and uh, and this is called the likelihood ratio, of course. And this is, by definition, the most powerful test statistic that you can ever use to discriminate the two classes. Okay, so this is the solution. But the problem is that we don't have access to these probability densities because we only have examples from them. Okay, so. We can approximate the likelihood ratio. Uh, yeah, so, so this is what I was saying. Uh, you don't have access to the densities themselves. There are nuisance parameters that make the problem more complex and, uh, and, uh, and not simple, the hypothesis test, okay? There is one theorem that helps you because you can do a change of variables so you can uh, construct a function of your data. So if your data is multidimensional, you can hardly constrain, uh, construct a, a likelihood ratio because it's too complicated. You have too little data to do that. Uh, even if you create an, ex an histogram of the, of the densities of signal and background, you cannot do this in multiple dimensions. But you can create uh, a summary, which is maybe a lower dimensional, one dimensional, and you have this equality that helps you because, uh, because uh, you can still use the name and Pearson's lemma, okay? The problem is that you may be losing information about the data by creating this summary statistics. And okay, one way to construct this uh, summary statistic is uh, with supervised learning. Uh, we can use a binary classifier that distinguishes uh, uh, X uh, when it's sampled from the two densities. This is a, a two process uh, which, uh, which you can construct the probability, the conditional probability this way for when Y is the class label, okay? So this is, this is, uh, this is the, the way you do it. And uh, you minimize the cross entropy uh, in the training uh, so this is the expectation uh, given the various, uh, uh, the two possible outcomes, okay? And uh, when you minimize this loss function, 
the solution actually approximates uh, the results of the optimal classifier, the likelihood ratio, in fact. Uh, so basically, uh, supervised classification is equivalent to likelihood ratio estimation uh, in this particular problem. All right. So the loss function is uh, is uh, is really what matters in these uh, multivariate uh, uh, classification problems when uh, you want to minimize uh, something and get uh, and get uh, the best out of your uh, answer. So the, the the thing that you want to minimize typically is the mean squared error, which is the sum of the variance and the squared bias. Okay, in general. Uh, but the mean squared error is not necessarily the most appropriate metric for our problem. In general, you can construct a loss function, which uh, tells you how far your prediction is from your target. Okay, and for instance, you could construct it as the expected expectation value over the full space of uh, of uh, of your loss function, the way you define it. Uh, uh, weighted by the probability of, of the various uh, um, data and the class labels. And you can compute this empirically by using your labeled data in your training sample by doing a simple average, okay? Um, so in binary classification, we have said that uh, you can model uh, the, the class assignment with this uh, uh, binomial distribution. And uh, so the loss function that we actually use uh, is, uh, is uh, defined through the logarithm of this. And, uh, and you can see that uh, this, is, uh, um, this, is, uh, this is the typical setup in these kind of problems. Uh, but uh, there are other problems where you use different, uh, different uh, uh, losses. I don't have time to go into this uh, much, very much, but okay. So typically we are doing binary classification. Um, there is one thing to, to mention. So, okay, I was, uh, I was making a parallel between uh, loss minimization and likelihood maximization. In fact, what we are typically doing when we train a classifier is we are trying to fit hypothesis to, uh, to data. So basically we are still doing uh, fitting in multi-dimension, of course, but uh, in order to understand better what we are doing and to understand that we have, a we have, a, we have the risk of, uh, of overfitting our training data, let's look at a one-dimensional example of fitting because this is what we are doing when we are training or when we are doing a regression, okay? So here, let's look at a one-dimensional regression of some points in this X versus Y space. So you have samples in blue and you can try, uh, and you have a true function from which the samples are drawn in green, and you can try to fit this with a simple or with a more complex or a, with a much more complex function. And you can see that uh, as you increase the model complexity, you go from uh, underfitting that is not extracting from the model the, 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 the salient features of your data to actually finding a good model, to finding a model that fits all the data points precisely because it hits each of them in the, in the eye. But as basically, that's because your model has basically the same dimensionality of your training data and it has uh, learned too much about the vagaries, the, the fluctuations in the data themselves, and it doesn't learn the real salient features of the data as a whole, but it is overfitting, okay? So this overfitting method, uh, this overfitting solution is failing to generalize. So it doesn't interpret the data that you have been given but uh, it, it, it only interprets, it, it interprets, it reads too much into the training data, okay? So um, you have to be very careful because overfitting can lead you to use a model which has large differences with the true model, much like underfitting, as you see here, okay? <coughs> so, we can try to look into this from a mathematical standpoint. So you can suppose that you have a certain model trained on some data to approximate a random variable. So it's a regression to T, okay? 
And you can, uh, uh, you, you have an expectation value of T and an expectation value of your, of your uh, estimator. Uh, so you can use, uh, you can study this to study the generalization error at any value of X by expanding the expectation value of the difference between your estimate and the true value. And this can be decomposed in three terms. And you can see that the first term is the expectation of T minus T hat, which is basically how well your data represents the true value, true value and it's noise. And you cannot improve this with a better model. But then you have a difference between the, 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 uh, the estimation of T and, uh, uh, and your F. And this is, uh, this is a bias. So your, your estimator may be biased and therefore uh, doesn't, doesn't give you the correct answer, even if we have large, uh, uh, large data sample, but you can make a more complex model and so make this uh, term smaller. And then you have a variance term, which is basically how uh, well you are approximating your estimator, the true, the, true, the true value of F. So the more complex the model is, uh, the, the, the higher this, this term becomes. Okay, so you have uh, again a, tri a variance versus bias uh, um, problem. And this is the sum of the two terms. Uh, and you can see that there is uh, typically as a function of the complexity of your model, you can reduce the bias uh, as you increase the complexity, but you will increase uh, the variance. And so you, there is, there is a, a sweet spot where, where you should be sitting which is an optimal trade-off between the two terms. So you, you must not overfit and you must not underfit, okay? Uh, in order to study these properties, you can use some uh, testing data, validation data. Let's call it testing data for simplicity here. So uh, uh, your, your data is precious, uh, so you, you have to invest them well uh, to train a, a very capable uh, classifier or regressor, but you also want to estimate the properties by looking at the validation curve and see if, it is the, uh, if the error is increasing, because you can study this as you train the classifier and you go towards a better and better training error, but you look at the validation data and at a certain point you see that uh, on a sample that has not been used for training, the error actually increases. So, um, so okay, let's look at the practical example from classification. So you have two predictor variables, uh, you can define a boundary and uh, well, you have some uh, misclassification error which you can uh, look in the training sample itself and you say, okay, this classifier is uh, <coughs> doing fairly. There's 16% uh, uh, misclassification error. But then you look at, uh, at uh, the same division boundary, which is fixed now, and you look at some validation data, some testing data, and you can estimate uh, uh, the validation error. So this is what you do, basically. You are looking at an independent sample, okay? And if you have a more complex uh, model that tries to overfit the data and trying to, to include all the events in the right part of the decision boundary, uh, you may find that the training error has increased a lot because you have actually uh, overfit the data. But uh, in fact, if you show it uh, to a, a validation test set, uh, you, uh, you, you, you have a large uh, error of classification. Okay, so here is another example where your training data is in blue classes and the validation data is these uh, red classes and uh, you have various models and you, if you are overfitting with nine parameters, you get this uh, purple curve. And you can see that uh, as the number of the polynomial order, in this case, this is uh, uh, trying polynomials to fit this data, has increased the polynomial order, you see that the Validation error becomes large and you should stop at some point, okay? <coughs> so you always should look at the graph like that to decide how much training you can do. And uh, okay, so you split your data into the training set and you have a validation set that allows you to see this uh, overtraining effect. 
But then you also have an independent sample that is independent from this procedure that you have uh, put in place to try and decide where to stop. And it's used to obtain a bi unbiased estimate, okay? And uh, you Hello. can, uh, yes? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. So um, uh, you said that you, you, don't need a, you don't need a break. We've uh, just covered, you've just covered about an hour and, and we yeah. still have an hour. I was just wondering um, if you would like to take all the questions at the end or uh, we pause for a minute to see if there are any questions. That is a good suggestion. I mean, uh, uh, what questions do you have? Because uh, you should always interrupt me if, uh, if something is unclear or if you want something to be explained more precisely. So yes, what questions do you have until now? But then please speak up. Don't worry about uh, raising hands or anything. And we won't, we won't be making a break because uh, there is too much material to go over, yeah. Great, so let me see if there are a raised hand, but you can, um, especially the students, you can simply go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question if you have, uh, if you have one. Uh, yeah, okay, I think, uh, I think uh, the message is clear, please. Please yes. uh, ask questions, okay? <laughs> so, uh, let's, so let's move on. Yeah. I have one yeah. question. Yeah. So, uh, hi. Uh, I, 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 um, yeah. I have one question on the, uh, on, the, on the data pre-processing actually. So you were talking about some features vector and you know, the, uh, before we feed that into a density estimator or a neural network, we do pre-processing by making the standardization procedure or also you can use some mean max method like you know where we can contain the features vector in some minus one to one or zero to one some you know in that interval so like is there any um, like preference over this like whether we should standardize our input variables or do the just simply scaling, I mean, max scaling, uh, or is it you know, uh, problem, spe problem specific or based on some performance metric? Yeah, so right. this largely depends on the kind of algorithm that you are using because there are algorithms that are very sensitive to uh, this kind of uh, rescaling. So I was mentioning the KNN algorithm that, uh, that uh, will uh, benefit if you are doing uh, balls in this multidimensional space. You will want to have a homogeneous definition of the distance in all the directions of space. So you want to divide by the variance, each variable. Uh, or you want to also uh, rescale the variables such that they have the same support in zero to one or minus one to one, but uh, the KNN will not like this because uh, if the variances are very different after you rescale, because some variables are highly peaked and some variables are, are showing a flat marginal, then the KNN will suffer from this a lot. Uh, the boosted decision trees or decision trees in general, which we will uh, discuss later, do not uh, uh, care about rescaling because they are uh, applying cuts uh, on, the, on, the, on the single variables and uh, you can define them any way you want as long uh, as your transformation is, uh, is uh, monotonous, it will work. Uh, neural networks uh, will, uh, will benefit from uh, preprocessing of this kind, uh, especially if you are doing some uh, some um, uh, weight regularization, but we will get there, okay? So we will see that in, in, in the second part of this lecture, okay? Okay, thank you. And I have just second questions on the distance metric, like what you talked about under density estimator. Like, I mean, I was thinking about how like Euclidean distance on a hyper uh, space, like, you know, multi-dimensional space. So is there any other metric that we can also, you know, explore to, uh, to check whether these two points are similar or dissimilar. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, 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 the issue of the metric in multidimensional space is, uh, is, uh, is a very complex and long uh, discussion, okay? So um, in general, uh, um, you can use this Euclidean density that I have shown uh, 
uh, which once you have uh, this divide, divided by the variance is already a well-defined object. But in general, with two multidimensional distributions, you have access to other definitions of densities uh, of the distributions as a whole, uh, you, you can have uh, uh, distance between distributions. Uh, you can take a, a single examples of your events and then uh, for them, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, definition of distance is connected to the, 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 the single features of the elements. But if you have a distribution, then you have the, the, the kullback Lieber, the Jensen-Shannon, you have many different uh, estimates of uh, how the distributions differ. So the topic of, uh, of the distance in multidimensional space is uh, quite varied and, uh, and complicated. I would leave it uh, aside as it is a little bit uh, um, marginal to these lectures. But uh, if you look in the book by Asti and Tish Bariani, uh, there's, there's a number of examples there. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So, okay, so, um, so you, you understand that when you're training a classifier or a regressor, you have a problem of this. Uh, you want to do this as well as possible. So you want to find the sweet spot here. Uh, in training, uh, or uh, as we will see in boosted decision trees, uh, the number of leaves uh, or other parameters uh, that these uh, tools uh, allow you to tweak and modify. And uh, in general, these are called the hyperparameters of your algorithm. And uh, you want to decide uh, uh, when you're doing a good job. In general, when you're training uh, the classifier, you have decide where to stop, how much you want to learn about the training data. And so um, you, can, uh, you, can, uh, you can do this uh, uh, with a thing that is k-fold cross-validation. Uh, this is a little bit more complex handling of, uh, of your data, of your validation data that allows you to, to do uh, more tricks. So uh, and uh, and get a more precise, uh, uh, more, more precise uh, estimation of, uh, for instance, the generalization error and other properties. So um, so I should explain what leave one out cross validation is before I talk about cross validation in general. Uh, so uh, you you can remove one event from a set and uh, try tra train the, 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 your classifier or learner on the other events. And then uh, you test it on uh, that event that you left out and you get the mean square error, which is of course a very rough estimate, but you can do it on all the events and take the average. And this is, this is a, a sort of estimate of a mean square error that you are, that you are committing. It's very time consuming if you have lots of data. Instead, what you can do it uh, is uh, that you, you can use, take your training sample and leave out a, a fraction of the data that you uh, use for validation of uh, the training. And you can do this in, in a number of ways, depending on which chunk of the data you're leaving out. And then you can uh, define uh, your, your estimates for the things that you want to check by the sampling properties of the sample of different trainings that you're done. Uh, there's even an, an advice that uh, for most problems, uh, this uh, number of splits uh, should be 10 or five or so, but uh, NASCII likes 10 for some reason. Um, so, and then you have to minimize the loss, really how you do it actually, right? Because you have talked about uh, <clears throat> training a model, but we have not discussed uh, what the loss uh, uh, must minimization is. I, I will leave this out uh, because it's actually not relevant, uh, but uh, you might find this enjoyable. It's uh, how you decide whether you want to take an insurance bet at blackjack, but let's, let's forget it. So um, to find the optimal value of the parameters of your model, you have to minimize a loss and you minimize the, it's, uh, it's like uh, the old problem, okay? Maximum likelihood or whatever. So, you have to descend towards the minimum or ascend toward the maximum by approximating uh, uh, a gradient, okay? You find the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters. 
And then you update the parameters with this gradient so that they go towards a better value of the loss. And uh, so you are going orthogonally to, to these, uh, uh, these curves of uh, same value of the loss if you go towards the gradient, okay? And success in this depends on how fast you descend because uh, you have a learning rate parameter here, which you need uh, to tune very, very carefully in some cases. And uh, um, computing the gradient with all your data would be stupid because it's too CPU intensity, intensive and uh, it also uh, would create huge gradients that do not allow you to map this, uh, this uh, landscape of the loss minima very carefully. Instead, if you use uh, small batches of events, or even if you look at single events, uh, you get an estimate of a gradient, which is highly noisy, but then it will also allow you to navigate this space better. But the better thing to do is to use mini batches. So you, you take a small chunk of data and you get, uh, and you get uh, the, the gradient uh, by using only this, uh, this chunk of data, and it is noisy to a certain extent, so it will not uh, be perfect, but this allows you also to jump away from minima. And uh, you have many different recipes, in fact, uh, for converging to the minimum of a loss function, and they make a difference in the time it takes to converge. And, uh, and, uh, and they depend on the recipe of the update of this learning rate, so how fast they take a step in a direction, if they increase the width of the step uh, in direction that is a very high gradient, uh, there, is, there is many different uh, ways that you can do this. As you see here, many different uh, algorithms are tested in their convergence properties. So you should experiment with different methods and try to understand what is best for your case because typically there is no free lunch. There is not a single method that works best in any problem, okay? Uh, when you look in many dimensions, uh, it is clear that uh, uh, the loss landscape uh, tends to have many subtle points because uh, uh, the probability that a point at zero gradient is a minimum goes to zero in a high dimension. It's typically a subtle, okay? So you have a direction where the loss is not changing and other directions where the loss is changing. And so you have to find ways to get out of, of these saddles. And uh, so this is an example of a subtle point in this direction. And so there are, there, there <coughs> you can be trapped, okay? And uh, so there's a lot of technology, as you will understand, uh, um, that shows you, there are various graphs that shows you how you can get trapped in the saddle and uh, this uh, makes you lose a lot of computational time. These are very, uh, various examples of this kind of behavior. Okay, so let's now look at uh, two different uh, algorithms, uh, the decision trees uh, and, uh, uh, and the neural networks. Uh, I will have to be very, very fast because I want to look at some practical applications. So you, you probably know what I'm talking about, so I will be very fast. So you have uh, a decision tree is constructed by leaves, which are rules that decide, uh, that allow you to to split the data in different classes, okay? So that at the end, uh, you have a decision because you have classes uh, that uh, you can, uh, you can uh, um, events that can be classified depending where they end up in this, uh, in this decision tree. Uh, so they allow you to partition this multidimensional space in hypercubes, basically, and each hypercube then say, you say, this is a signal rich region, this is a background rich region, depending on uh, the value of all the features. This is a two variable example, uh, and you have defined the decision rules that are these uh, vertical uh, lines, uh, and this allows you to partition the space in uh, signal rich and background rich regions. Okay? So a decision tree is a quite simple way to decide which is signal and which is background, okay? And they can be very powerful, okay? Because uh, with many, um, many such decision boundaries, you can create uh, uh, a very complex example such as this one. Um, I think I will uh, skip how you train a tree because we don't have uh, time. 
there is uh, an indicator of uh, the impurity of a node. When you are defining a rule, you define uh, whether the node will split the data as signal or background. And uh, in the data as uh, you catalog with these cuts uh, uh, at each node, uh, they will have a certain impurity, they will have a certain fraction of signal and background. And uh, so you have the, some uh, measures of the impurity. You want to have a high purity of nodes because you want them to classify the signal as well as possible. But you want also that the, the class probabilities are high enough that uh, this uh, classification doesn't become too noisy. One thing to do this is called the Gini index. That is called. Uh, that is basically basically defined as the product of the probabilities uh, of of the data being, being signal and background in, in that particular node. And uh, and this is a nonlinear uh, nonlinear uh, uh, estimator of the split, uh, which uh, helps uh, the 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 classifier do its job uh, well because uh, because uh, a nonlinear rule uh, helps you. Uh, in in the training, okay. Uh, I I think this is not very relevant, uh, uh, and I will skip this uh, uh, this uh, this information. Uh, you can look it up and ask me questions offline if you want. So the point is that with a decision tree, as with any other many other tools, uh, if you, it it is liable to overtraining because if you make many many decision rules looking at your training data, you may end up chasing your individual examples and create artificial points in this uh, in this uh, decision rule space, uh, which uh, which is learning too much from the training data. Okay, and then they will generalize poorly because you, you look at another sample and the, it will perform poor, poorly. <clears throat> So you have a diagram like this, where if you de decrease the size of the leaf, so the amount of data that you have in each, in each, uh, in each leaf, you will uh, have uh, an error which decreases because it will classify better and better. But at some point, uh, you, you continue to decrease the training error. But at some point, the, the test error, the validation error, if you want, uh, will start to increase again. So you have to decide where to stop the, the training, okay? And this is uh, what you typically look at uh, when you are doing uh, when you are doing this kind of uh, of uh, uh, application. Uh, so decision trees are attractive uh, because they are simple to interpret, also in low dimensions, and demand no preprocessing, as I was saying before. But they also have shortcomings because uh, you have problems with overfitting because you have to be very careful with the validation. And um, so the training uh, is very sensitive to modeling issues in some cases. So, okay, you can do some things uh, to uh, mend the, 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 the and uh, so you can do in particular ensembling. So you create many different decision trees and make the average and they will, uh, uh, behave better. So let's leave uh, uh, um, let's leave early stopping by itself. Uh, and ensembling is actually a very common procedure, not just for decision trees, but it has been used very very much with it. So you grow many trees, and then you take a majority vote on whether the event is a signal or background. And, uh, and this has good statistical properties. So you have individual models uh, that try to fit the function and they have uh, a larger variance. And then when you take the ensemble, it fits the data much better. And then uh, there are techniques, uh, uh, um, techniques that allow this to become more powerful, in particular, uh, random forests uh, and, uh, and the boosted decision trees are the most advanced to such methods. Uh, boosting is based on uh, training a sequence of models uh, uh, by using the fact that some events were misclassified by the earlier models to give more weights to them such that uh, the, uh, the new models will uh, uh, concentrate better on the events that are harder to classify and uh, improve the global characteristics of the classifier. Um, the other boost algorithm is the simplest. Uh, and uh, you see, you create a chain of classifiers 
by reweighting events that are classified by badly by 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 the previous ones. Um, and on this is is uh, is based uh, a number of other techniques. Um, so let's leave alone uh, um, decision trees uh, and the takeaway bits is that classification is a rich subject, of course. The metrics of optimality vary a lot, so be very careful because the one that you want in your particular application uh, depends on you and what you want to do, okay? And in particular, the loss. The loss uh, function contains, actually, uh, is the engine of what you produce, okay? Uh, careful testing is always uh, a good idea, okay? And you can do this uh, with uh, cross-validation. Good. So what am I doing with time? Uh, I'm about good. So let's talk a little bit about neural networks so that uh, we can then look at some high energy physics examples in more detail. So what is a neural network? I, I bet all of you know what a neural network is, but it is basically a model. If you want, it, is, uh, it can be conceived as a, a model of our brain because our brain is also a network of neurons that are connected by, uh, by axons that basically transmit electric signals between them. And uh, we store information in these neurons uh, because neurons have a certain activation function that decides, uh, potential in fact, that decides whether the neuron fires a signal to the nearby neurons uh, or not. And this, uh, this, uh, this firing of the neuron depends on uh, the input that the neuron receives from others. So this kind of, uh, of network in our brain is, uh, is not, uh, is not uh, a sequential uh, feedforward network as the ones that are mostly typical in, in our applications. Although in high energy physics, we have started to use graph networks and other more complex uh, setups. But in general, okay, what you have uh, is uh, an input layer where you specify the values of some training data um, features. And then these are connected to nodes uh, in hidden layers that are uh, receiving this output and they decide whether to fire an information to the, uh, to the uh, downstream neurons, uh, depending on some activation functions and some parameters that the nodes carry with them. And at the end of the day, this uh, uh, gets to an output. It may be many different outputs, but it may be also a single output for the binary classification is all you need, a number that tells you this is signal, this is background. And, uh, and, uh, and so the network, uh, we learn uh, this training data by adjusting the values of their nodes uh, to perform their task of classification and separation as well as possible. So let's look into this. <clears throat> so, you should think of a neural network as a complex function that fits the input data because this is what it is. That this function can have millions of parameters, okay? And uh, a very special thing that was realized is that uh, although you have a number of parameters that may be even larger than your uh, input data, this network can still have a very good generalization properties because in fact, uh, <clears throat> because in fact, uh, when you have the flexibility of many many parameters, uh, the the model that actually fits your data the best uh, is still one that uh, that generalizes well. This is a complex uh, topic, so I, I will I wanted to mention it, but uh, let's uh, let's look what inside uh, what's inside the neural network. As I said, an input layer and then uh, hidden layers and an output, for instance. And uh, um, what you want is to find parameter values that minimize a loss function. So it's a minimization problem. Again, the one of training. So what are you going to do with uh, this loss? Uh, the loss function is defined when you have an output and with the output, you, define, you decide uh, whether an event uh, of training is a signal or background. And then you look if it is really a signal or background and you compute a binary cross entropy loss, for instance, okay? And, uh, and uh, so what do you do with it is back propagation. 
this is the crucial step where you take the loss and you go and ask, okay, but you uh, weight of neuron 32, uh, if I increase you, do my loss, does my loss decrease or not? And you do this by looking at a mini batch of events, going, uh, computing the loss and then computing the gradient of the loss uh, with respect to that weight. And you then can know if you can uh, uh, increase or decrease the weight. But wait, th this, this weight might be deep inside in the network. So in order to compute the gradient of the loss, you have to propagate the gradients uh, with the rules of, uh, of uh, chain differentiation. And this is what uh, <coughs> the back propagation step does. Let's leave alone the, the, the perception. Um, we, I just, uh, I just mentioned that uh, that you have. So, okay, if you want to look at the math of how really this uh, this back propagation works, you have it here. But um, uh, there are many different activation functions that take the input and decide whether an output is given or not. And crucially, they have to be nonlinear because. Uh, um, Nonlinearity is what gives flexibility to this model of fitting arbitrarily complex functions. So you have many different uh, activation functions to, you to choose from, uh, um, and, uh, and uh, these are only a few of them, okay? Uh, and I was mentioning the learning rate before. It's uh, this parameter that tells you how much you should up update your parameters uh, while you're learning features from mini batches of data from the training. And uh, here is a cartoon which tells you, shows you how you must be careful in adjusting your learning rate. You start here, and this is the profile of the loss as a function of an abstract direction of space. And if your learning rate is too high, you may very, very quickly glow, go to a very low value but then uh, it, it will fail to converge because it, it doesn't cor correctly adapt itself to the narrowness of this well. So uh, you could choose a, a smaller learning rate, but it would take uh, a lot of time uh, to reach the minimum, but you can have an adaptive learning rate, which de de becomes smaller as the gradient becomes flatter. So, this, uh, this learning rate is, one, in fact, one of the crucial, crucial parameters in the search for the optimal point. And there's a whole literature on this topic, okay? Then also, as you train the network, uh, these weights may become very large. Uh, and uh, so it, uh, there are a few uh, ways that you can uh, keep uh, your, your parameters uh, constrained, which has uh, good, uh, good uh, properties. One of them is to regularize the loss. Another one is to prune the loss by cutting some, uh, some nodes from it. We won't go into that because uh, we have to look at other things also. Here's a graph of various networks, uh, which shows you that the really the, the, their topology, their organization is different from, uh, is, uh, can be adapted to different problems. So you should be careful uh, and design your network in a way that is suitable for the problem you want to solve. Uh, and it's not just choosing the neural network that you want for the task, because uh, really high energy physics is a complex, uh, complex uh, task. Uh, the extracting a parameter of nature from some data that you collect uh, from particle collisions is not just classification, okay? Because you, you want to do many different things at once. So, so you have some data and uh, you have an independent data set that you can use for some tests uh, and you can do classification and uh, select your data that you want to do the analysis with and maybe extract the parameter that you wanted to measure by doing a regression. But then uh, you also have a control sample that you want to, to, to use to check that, um, that uh, your model is correct. So you have another regression task. Maybe you have some systematic uncertainties also in your data and you want to check them. So, and then you have to treat uh, uh, systematic uncertainties. 
And all of these, you see, there are many different tasks. And uh, typically, uh, a lot of time is spent in the classification uh, of separation of signal and background. But indeed, this may play only a minor role in the end in the final variance of the parameter of interest that you produce. So the message of this slide is that uh, the more you can think of your problem as a single problem and, uh, and then uh, divide your resources uh, to, uh, um, uh, to address it as best as possible and also to uh, account for the interrelationship of these blocks, the better uh, result you get. This is a little bit vague, but I'll get to what I need uh, to what I need to explain uh, uh, later if I, if I have time. So uh, one example of this is uh, the fact that uh, if we search for a signal or we want to find the uh, measure the cross section for a small signal on a large background, we do classification. So we do dimensionality reduction uh, from a set of data. And, uh, and then only at the end, uh, sorry, this is too far, uh, wait a second. So you do a classification of signal and background and, uh, and define a, a selected sample, and then you do inference and extract the cross-section of the parameter. Okay. Uh, and only at the end of the classification, you ask yourself, okay, but there are systematic uncertainties due to the modeling of the training data and other things. So I will look at them and this increases the uncertainty, the uncertainty on this parameter. So systematic effects are not contained. They were not known by the model that produced the classification. And therefore <clears throat> the classificator, the classifier is uh, uh, misaligned with the task of extracting the best possible variance for your inference step. So how to go about this is to let the neural network know about the uh, final uncertainty on the parameter in, of interest that you extract after you use the output of the neural network to construct a likelihood and extract inference for the parameter of interest. This is a little bit vague, but if you can pull it off, it means that your neural network becomes aware of the final task, what you really want to do with its own output, uh, the output of the classifier, you, you want to measure something, but you are liable to systematics. So if you know, if you let the network know about the systematic uncertainties, it will realign itself and give you a loss function, which is proportional to the variance of the parameter. If you can do that, then you improve the properties. And this has been shown in this paper. And you see that a loss function profile uh, becomes narrower, that meaning that you estimate the parameter of interest with a smaller uncertainty than what you do with a regular uh, approach, which only deals with systematics at the end, uh, at the end of the training. Okay, so this is what I call the realignment of of the task, or the considering the whole problem together. You can do this with deep neural networks that have many hidden layers. And we have advanced tasks, advanced, uh, <clears throat> advanced uh, architectures also. Among uh, deep neural networks, uh, we can look a little bit at convolutional neural networks, which have been used, for instance, in image classification. So here yeah, you have a bunch of muffins and a bunch of uh, dogs, and uh, it's not easy to tell them apart, <laughs> apparently. So this is a typical good problem for a convolutional neural network because these images can be rotated, can be translated. So if you think at each pixels in these images as a, a bit of information, you realize that in order to be sensitive to the features, you must be able to translate, to rotate, uh, and to do things that you can do in uh, architectures like uh, a convolutional neural network that, uh, that uh, basically transform the data by reducing it in a way that also summarizes all these features uh, in a translational and rotational invariant way. So for instance, you have, uh, you have uh, this mask, which you see is moving uh, in this uh, uh, matrix of pixels and produces a compressed output, uh, which depends on how many, uh, how many 
how many points are in specific uh, uh, locations of this uh, of this mask. Okay, and you get a representation of the input data. Uh, is a, here is an example of a filter, which is the identity filter, does nothing. But then let's look at uh, a blurring filter, which basically uh, smears a little bit the image, you see, or one that actually uh, sharpens the image by, by enhancing the features. You see that it sharpens it. So, uh, or you can uh, find the edges in this uh, image, and this is actually at the core of learning the specific features of images, finding the, the edges of objects that are represented in it, you see. Oh, there are other things about convolutional neural networks I won't go into, but uh, they have been used uh, a lot in, uh, in a task, which is uh, pretty much an image uh, uh, detection uh, uh, problem, which is uh, uh, boosted jets uh, detection and classification. Uh, what is a boosted jet? Is a jet uh, of particles that are produced with high transverse momentum, and therefore, uh, uh, when you have a, a massive particle that decays inside this jet uh, or produces many jets that are close in angle, like a top quark, which is highly boosted, produces three jets, but they can merge in a single jet or a Higgs boson or a W boson. What was realized at the beginning of this century was that uh, uh, if you look inside uh, uh, fat jets for these uh, decays, uh, electroweak decays, in fact, of these uh, heavy particles, you can actually discriminate them better than if you take individual jets of non-boosted uh, uh, decays of this object, which is quite surprising. But this has opened up to the technology of imaging, where you see you can look at images of the energy flow inside the jets and discriminate the decay of, of a heavy mass particle from here, for instance, is a signal of a top quark decay and a QCD jet. And you can see it from an average of many images, but a single image may be very sparse. So with this convolutional neural networks, we are doing much of this job and we are uh, extending our sensitivity. So a few practical tips now, notice the outcome. Uh, you should know yourself. Uh, you should understand the specific needs of your problem. Is it classification or uh, density estimation? <laughs> it might be uh, silly to say this, but it's actually an important uh, uh, check at the beginning, because sometimes you can approach a problem from many sides. And uh, are your data tall or wide? Because depending on, on what your data are, uh, the method that you want to use is different. If you have low dimensionality, all you need is a KNN uh, classifier, for instance. And uh, many, many questions uh, uh, have different answers that uh, you must sort out. Um, yeah. So typically, everybody's going towards deep neural networks. They certainly do very well, but they can be very complex to train, OK? So be careful. Uh, in general, there is no a priori method that outperforms others because, <clears throat> well, the Neyman Pearson's lemma is all you need, but it can only be applied in very specific situations, OK? There have been empirical analyses that uh, prove that uh, random forests are typically uh, the most performant methods in a number of occasions. Uh, but you should try simple th things first because uh, statistical, simple statistical learning tools typically work very well. They are simple, easier to interpret, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, can work out of the box, okay? You should always try to augment your data based on your domain knowledge. If you can construct, uh, construct high-level high features from your data, if you can, you should always uh, uh, remove, uh, um, uh, remove and exploit symmetries in your training data, for instance, uh, in a collider uh, event, uh, you can rotate along the phi direction so that all the events look the same, and this will help a classifier or, uh, uh, or, uh, or create mirror images of the events uh, along eta, because uh, if there is the same uh, projectile on the same sides of your collider. So we can talk a, a lot about this, but uh, 
there's a number of things that will make uh, your analysis better, okay? So it's not just uh, take the data, apply deep neural network uh, and see what comes out. You have to do all of this. Pre-processing of the data is very useful, typically. So I have a few minutes left, actually, not many. And uh, I want to go through a few examples uh, because there's really hundreds. As was mentioned by the, by the chair uh, before my talk, 2012 is a turning point, not just because we discovered the Higgs, but also because uh, ImageNet uh, got uh, to superhuman performance in classifying images. And uh, in fact, uh, before 2012 uh, at the LHC, if you use the neural network in an analysis, people would not let it go, but they would, it would stay in review forever because people were, would not be convinced. And after 2012, if you are doing a cut-based analysis, people will ask you that you do a neural network analysis rather. So there has been a paradigm change and there will be more paradigms change in the future. One of those will be using end-to-end uh, -end optimization techniques, which are brought forward by differentiable programming, which is uh, uh, performed with libraries such as PyTorch and TensorFlow and JAX. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the really the cutting edge, uh, basically deep learning techniques applied uh, on a grander scale. But okay, let's stay with our feet on the ground. The most common problems in energy, high energy physics is to extract a small signal from large backgrounds, so it's classification. But also we do a lot of regression. And we also would like to start doing more of anomaly detection, okay? So uh, recently also uh, uh, to the forest come generative adversarial networks that allow, for instance, to construct uh, fast simulations if you can prove that the fast and the full simulation basically are the same, and you can do this by training a, 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 an adversarial network that tries to discriminate data that is generated by the fast and the full simulation. This is just an example, okay? So I have a few, a few examples. Uh, I will not be able to go uh, through all of them. Uh, let's see what we have here. So in general, there's this ubiquitous problem of uh, of improving the energy resolution of jet pairs, because this is uh, on this we base much of what we do in LHC physics, for instance, right? Uh, we have done it with photons to detect the Higgs boson, but uh, we also uh, do it with big quark jets, and we can in fact improve the resolution and therefore the observability of a peak in a mass distribution. But we also want to classify, I've given you this example where you find a small signal only if you can really separate it from huge backgrounds. And uh, often, uh, uh, often you have to deal with, uh, with modeling issues that affect uh, your Monte Carlo. Here, there is a table from a nature review of machine learning that shows you what is the sensitivity for several processes with and without the machine learning uh, uh, tools? So you really can't do without these uh, any longer, okay? This uh, is uh, a no-brainer by now. And we use deep learning for it. Uh, this is an example. The Kagolix challenge was made in 2014 to actually test the different uh, machine learning tools. Uh, they asked people to classify signal versus background. The signal was X to the case to Tau Tau in, in the Atlas detector. And uh, 1,800 teams participated. And it turned out that uh, an analysis done uh, as you would have done it uh, 30 years ago uh, was, uh, was, uh, was much less performant than the winning solution, which was based on pooling uh, a set of deep neural networks. This is equivalent to having six times more data. And you know that data is valuable, costs money, costs uh, even uh, electricity to run the accelerator, okay? So this is very relevant for us. This is the Kago challenge. Uh, you can still run it uh, if you want. You go here and uh, you can test yourself and your uh, algorithm of choice. Um, so these are the winning solutions. And uh, recently, uh, 
Giles Strong uh, is a postdoctoral uh, student, uh, postdoctoral scientist who's working with me, has uh, redone this to show that uh, that uh, that you could uh, actually win, do, uh, 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 replicate the results of, of the winning solution of Kaggle uh, with uh, much less uh, computing uh, if you did. Uh, data augmentation techniques uh, and uh, some uh, some uh, some other features uh, to improve the model and it was able to study what was giving the best uh, results uh, so data augmentation and ensembling are winning here so this is a message to take off and in general we are searching for new physics so now new physics searches can be done in a model dependent way or in a model independent way we have all been enamored uh, with uh, Susie searches because uh, Susie has been, uh, was before the LHC turned down uh, uh, in the mind of many people, uh, what we would certainly discover. But we found out that it is quite hard to find a black cat in a dark room, especially as in the case of supersymmetry, if there is no cat. So <laughs> indeed the problem is that we have models of new physics but we, we can test them, but we don't find anything because there is nothing to discover and the cat might be hiding somewhere else. So we might uh, want to search our data in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in model independent ways that uh, make no assumptions on where the cat is hiding, okay? But this has to do, then arises the point of multiple testing. That is, if you search for the cat in, in a, a gazillion different places, you might actually find a, a spurious cat somewhere because your, your error rate, uh, your type 1 error rate uh, is not zero. So you know what the type 1 error rate, because Arizona Prosper has explained it in hypothesis testing earlier. And uh, we use the five sigma criterion for discovery significance. That translates to a p-value for, uh, for, the, for the error rate of type 1 error rate is, is 3 times 2 minus 7, <clears throat> but it is not zero. And if you make a million searches, then you will likely come up with a five sigma criterion sometimes. Okay, so, but still we do it. So one way to do it is to histogram your data and then define any possible search region of any of your histograms and then look for the highest possible significance of these search regions with respect to a, a background model. Okay, this has been done by a CMS analysis, which uh, looks uh, here, at, uh, these are number of regions where you have looked for your signal. And here is in Monte Carlo data, you can show that if you have a signal of new physics, you will find classes that have a very, very small probability that is in excess of the number of classes that you would expect by share uh, type one error rate. So you see a signal as an excess of low probability classes. And then you can do this in real data and you find this, which is in agreement with the pro, the, the, this green curve, which uh, shows uh, what uh, the, the p-value distribution of the number of classes you've tested should be. So you don't see any new physics, but this is a model independent search this example of the sphaleron here was just one example, but if you do this systematically, you may be sensitive to new physics searches. So this is a, a sort of an unsupervised way to look at the data. And you realize that uh, uh, unsupervised learning is uh, becoming stronger and stronger in, in all human applications and also in particle physics, we are starting to use it. So this is an example. Tommaso, uh, yes. you wanted me to give you an alert at 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing fine with that. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. So if you want to go unsupervised, there are a number of ways th that you can do this. And uh, if you look for that living review of, an, of uh, machine learning, by Ben Nachman, you will find that uh, uh, particle physicists have already published uh, hundreds of papers on, uh, on, on anomaly detection, for instance. This is my contribution to it. And uh, we're actually publishing this in, uh, in, um, in JHEP. Um, so uh, what this particular algorithm does is, uh, is multiple testing in, uh, in the copula space. What the copula space is, 
uh, is uh, you take the feature space of all your interesting features of the data, which may be 30 or 50 or whatever, and you stretch each variable or shrink it such that it fits in a zero to one support, but in a way that it makes its marginal flat. So for instance, if you have a bump in variable one, you stretch it such that the bump decreases and the tails increase. So you create a one-to-one -one modification. It's called the probability integral transform. It's a, it's a, it's a invertible transformation that will make this margin perfectly flat. And you can do this in all the directions of space so that at the end of the day, you, are, you will be looking at a hypercube uh, of sizes zero to one. And if you look at the data in all the directions of space, it is flat. This allows you to have a, a, a starting hypothesis of uh, uh, homogeneity of the data, because if you look at the uh, data that, in all the variables that are typically in a collider event, you will have uh, invariant masses, momenta, et cetera, that have a sharply falling distribution. And so an algorithm that is trying to look for an overdensity in this space will concentrate on low momentum where you have most of your data because it's the highest over density region. But you don't want that because you know that in fact, the interesting regions is away from the, the peaks of the, of the data. So this transformation creates a more uniform space where an anomaly detection can look for this uniformities. This is a view of two variables at a time, variable one versus variable two, variable one versus variable three, variable one versus variable four. And you see that after you have transformed your data, the, the data doesn't show any very, very significant feature. There are correlations, of course, in these two dimensional plots, the blue ones that you see on the left, but you can hardly see really high density regions. Because you have stretched the data in variable, in all the variables such that it look uniform when you look from one direction or the other, okay, on the marginals. But the algorithm, what it does, it looks for a, a hypercube, uh, sorry, a hyper rectangle, if you want, in this uh, uh, multidimensional space in uh, um, uh, which the highest density predicting the density with a sideband in the multiple dimensions. And uh, so it looks for the box that uh, has the highest density with respect to its uh, surroundings. So it is basically a local, uh, a local estimate of the density. And uh, the algorithm, if, if you look, uh, is able to capture over densities. This is, uh, this is the data that is selected in green by this uh, multidimensional box. And in red is uh, data that would be selected in all the variables, but not in the two that you have uh, uh, drawn the box. So in various views here, all the, all the variables. So this algorithm has proven to work. And now we are testing it on real CMS data. And uh, I'm presently working on this. So this is the frontier, if you want, because you let the machine discover structure in the data. Okay, and I have very few minutes left. So uh, another example of unsupervised learning, uh, because this is really the, 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 the future, if you want, is uh, a work that we did to uh, categorize different possible signature of X pair production. Now for HLLHC, the X pair production is important. So let's look at what you will be using as benchmarks when, when looking for uh, anomalous dihex production. You can produce dihex production with this kind of diagrams, uh, but uh, if there are anomalous uh, uh, Wilson coefficients uh, that you can, uh, in an effective field theory, categorize these possible production mechanisms, <clears throat> you have additional parameters to study. And these correspond to a number of possible different theories. There are five, uh, five uh, coefficients that uh, relate to the strengths of these couplings. And these different values of these couplings may give rise to different topologies in the final state. So how do you go about it? Are you going to study a, a, an infinity of possible new physics uh, signatures? Um, 
So you have a five dimensional parameter space of possible new physics theories that uh, produce anomalous x pair production. And what you want to do is to find the structure in this space. So the kind of final state uh, will be different in all these points of final space. But you want to define benchmarks <clears throat> that are representative that because they describe uh, kinematics that are similar. So what we did is to scan for this space uh, with a fast simulation and looked at the topology of the final state and creating a measure of similarity between these different theories. And uh, uh, we looked at the PDFs of these, uh, of these points in parameter space of rele relevant variables that we can observe in, uh, in uh, real data. And, uh, and so we trained, uh, we tried to define uh, a measure of distance, uh, a measure like the kullback leibler uh, In this case, it was a likelihood ratio test statistic. And uh, we were able to uh, see which of these theories was really different in the kinematics and which was not very different so that uh, we were able to find the specific points of the parameter space, which were defining the most <coughs> representative points. So we were made making a clustering uh, of the space, uh, depending on the variable, uh, the value of this, uh, of this uh, test statistic that was telling us how discrimin discriminating the, the, the kinematics were. And okay, I have no time to explain it, but in the end, you see, for instance, the Higgs mass, which can have a very specific uh, uh, features. It can be a single bump or a double bump or a bump with a long tail. And this clustering technique allows us to define uh, uh, the most representative theory among a class that you see are these gray other distributions that are similar uh, in this metric of, of likelihood. And so uh, this allowed us to define 12 benchmark theories, depending on the values of these uh, anomalous couplings. And these are now used by all analysis that look for this uh, uh, new physics uh, in X pair production. So I think my time is over and uh, uh, I want to conclude. And uh, one thing before I conclude is to uh, say that uh, we have realized that uh, we have a misalignment problem in high energy physics because we optimize our classification task, but then we have to account for systematic uncertainties which the neural network doesn't know about. This is a misalignment. And so it uh, uh, loses us sensitivity, okay? So there's a whole new area of studies that involves the full optimization of not just the analysis uh, taking into account the systematic uncertainties, but actually also how you construct your detector. Okay, we cannot construct from scratch uh, a new DEX CMS and ATLAS detectors, but there's a number of other projects that are in their developing phase. And so we want to target those and, and, uh, and uh, because we have been building detectors based on some uh, well-working paradigms. So we, uh, we, uh, we know how to build detectors for particle physics applications, but uh, these paradigms that we live by are not optimal for the tasks that we have. And instead, if we can study the design of these algorithms with uh, in mind what we really want to do with these detectors, we can arrive at an end-to-end -end optimization of the design including the detector, the systematic uncertainties, the inference, uh, the money that we want to spend. Uh, so we have a complex loss function. Uh, I already showed you this example of Inferno. Instead, uh, uh, here you have an example of uh, the optimization of the muon shielding of a detector for, uh, of, uh, uh, for the ship experiment that was looking for, uh, for dark matter signal. And uh, here you want to shield the muons in the detector and you can do it with magnets. And you see that uh, a deep learning machinery is able to find the best configuration that reduces the background by a factor of two. So these tools can be used. They involve the use of differentiable programming. And we want to now do it for more complex uh, applications. So here is a flow chart 
of a, a task uh, of a detector. For instance, you can have JAN4, which is uh, the particle simulation that uses the latent space parameters to simulate physics processes to create particle level truth which you then pass through a detector simulation to get your detector response. And then you do a pattern recognition, you do an analysis and you obtain your final measurement. If you can create a differentiable model of J and four such that you can bypass it and use the differentiable model, then you can create the gradients of your loss function and uh, update the geometry parameters in a, in a pipeline that creates a loop which can optimize the geometry, optimize the pattern recognition and uh, the systematic uncertainties, taking care of the cost parameters that affect uh, the loss function, and you can optimize the full system. We are starting to do this uh, in many different applications. Uh, one is muon tomography, another is uh, studying hybrid calorimetry. And uh, uh, it's really, really difficult, of course, because our detectors are maddeningly complex, but we have to do it because, uh, um, because uh, we have to invest as well as we can the money that we spend in these detectors. It doesn't make any sense any longer to construct very redundant uh, uh, detectors nowadays. It made sense 50 years ago when uh, uh, okay, we are studying subnuclear particles that we cannot uh, go back and measure if we screw it up the first time and we cannot see these particles. So you want to be sure of what you are doing. So you construct detectors that more or less do the same thing multiple times. But in the future, there will be machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence tools that will reconstruct this particle signal and extract the inference and do the pattern recognition for us. So we want to realign our design to these future uh, algorithms and tools. And this is the way to do it. And there is a collaboration that I'm uh, the spokesperson of that involves uh, 20 institutions uh, of physicists and computer scientists that are working at these use cases to try and show that we need to have more of this when we do uh, when we design uh, these detectors that cost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, we want to do it uh, in the most uh, cost-effective and uh, uh, goal-effective manner possible. Okay, to conclude, I hope this lecture brought you a little bit closer to the world of machine learning, if you were not so. And uh, as with any field in rapid development, you do not need to become all knowledgeable you can start by doing, and this will give you a little bit of, uh, of uh, a chance to, to get exposed to new things, okay? And it is fun to play with these tools, uh, fun in a sense if you, if you, if you like to, to program and do these kind of things, but okay. So some final takeaway bits. Don't look for the most complex solution in the first place because you can get stuck. Try easy things first, okay? Um, the mastery comes from uh, optimally combine the proper ingredients. And, and uh, this is not easy, so it becomes uh, something that you do good after you are an expert, of course. The loss function of the neural network is really where the money is, so you should spend time thinking about it and uh, how to incorporate as much as you can of the problem at hand. Thank you very much. This is all I had to, for you today. Thank you, uh, Tommaso, for the uh, great lecture on, on machine learning. Um, there's a lot to absorb. Uh, I, I wish, we wish uh, that we had uh, more time uh, for this. Um, but uh, now we are in tea break, so we can, uh, we can take uh, some questions, but before uh, before that, I want to take ten seconds to to say something uh, which I'm tempted to. Um, this is more for the more for the students. Uh, so I have been um, a follower for a long time uh, of a blog page that Thomas so <laughs> maintains, <laughs> and it's called Science 2.0. Join the revolution. So if you are interested, do Google search and. Um, 
and visit that page. And also, uh, Tommaso is uh, the author of the book Anomaly, Collider Physics and the Quest for New Phenomena, which is by World Scientific. Uh, again, so if you're interested, uh, please do uh, take a look at the book. And uh, with that, uh, the session is open for questions. So um, please raise your hand or, or just go ahead, unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Pritam. Okay, so Pritam. Yes, uh, yes. Pritam, please go ahead. Hello? Do you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, so actually, I was asking some details about the, I mean, uh, for the, I mean, inference based uh, stochastic uh, gradient that you have shown. So here, I mean, uh, so, so what are you actually doing? I mean, I mean, uh, so for the individual, I mean, the individual systematics. So you are putting the uh, systematics as the as some parameters. I mean, just the uh, plus minus one sigma and the nominal value as some parameter. And then <clears throat> finally, uh, so uh, so so what uh, what it is doing? I mean I mean uh, I mean how the loss function is changing because uh, I mean the effect of parameter. I mean I mean how the loss function is changing based on that. I mean yeah. Uh, because yeah yeah, yeah, yeah so uh, so I mean uh, so so for if I don't consider the systematics, then uh, then what you do that uh, for for each event. You just uh, calculate the, uh, you, you know the true value. You calculate the uh, estimated value by the neural network. Then you, uh, then you calculate the loss function, and you try to try to minimize that loss function. And based on that, you get the signal and background, and that go to your discriminant final discriminant beans, right? That's right. Yes. So uh, now, now how do I? I mean, if I uh, want to. So, 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 so now basically the loss function is uh, replaced by some likelihood function, right? Yeah, no, so let's, let's look at this yes. graph. Yes. So <clears throat> you have a simulator that produces example training data and, okay. uh, and, uh, and this is also depends on some parameters, okay? So uh, your neural network uh, uh, as a discriminator tasks uh, and produces an output uh, which is uh, Actually, it's uh, 10 different nodes of output uh, that, uh, that are made differentiable by a soft max function. But okay, the point is that uh, you get this output and this output, uh, uh, what you do with it is you emulate the inference step. That is, you take this uh, and you pass it through, uh, you create an asymptote likelihood that is uh, a, a, a ideal mixture of signal and background in this uh, in this representation of the data, from which you extract, uh, for instance, the fraction of signal that is your parameter of interest, uh, um, uh, given uh, given a mini batch of data, if you want, okay, and that allows you to extract the uncertainty on the signal fraction. Now. Um, if you uh, if this con con uh, this uh, this uh, extraction contains information about uh, the uh, the one sigma variations of nuisance parameters, uh, the likelihood can correctly account for them and extract uncertainties uh, due to these parameters in the cross section in the signal fraction. So. Uh, this uh, returns there is uh, this returns a covariance matrix that tells you basically how much these parameters are affecting the model and how much they are affecting the final result so you can take the information matrix which basically tells you how much uh, variation how much uncertainty there is in the uh, parameter of interest and uh, you can uh, uh, plug them back in the neural network so that you make uh, the network aware of what happens if you vary the nuisance parameters. And this allows the network to adjust the weights such that you can basically define a loss of this neural network, which is constructed with the information matrix on the cross-section measurement itself. So that is to say the network will not maximize a binary cross entropy. The network maximizes uh, the inverse variance on the parameter of interest. 
And it is able to do so because it is aware, it is made aware of the covariance matrix of the measurement uh, by this uh, backward loop. Okay, uh, and another uh, small question that, uh, I mean, uh, because the, the factors which, uh, I mean, affect the shape uncertainty, this can be, I mean, I mean, I mean this can be the parameters here, but the, the factors which uh, affects the normalization uncertainties, I mean, is this, I mean, is this important here or or is, or does this yes the mm. in the paper in the paper we also show how, how you can constrain um, normalization uncertainties uh, in pretty much the same way um, it's uh, still based on uh, on uh, on propagating this through this likelihood asymptote asymptot likelihood I think this is a bit too technical in the sense that it certainly interests you, but I don't think it interests everybody here. So I would leave a little bit of space to the other uh, uh, questioners, uh, but you are certainly uh, most welcome if you, if, you, if you send me an email or we can even chat about this. Of course, I see that you are interested in this algorithm. We are trying to apply it to real CMS data right now. So uh, we are certainly very happy if there are other people that want to try and use it. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, um, thanks. Um, other questions? I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead and ask questions. So, um, before we close the session, I I wanted to quickly ask one question. It is um, probably more of uh, more a curiosity about history. So, um, uh, 2012 with the AlexNet, um, there was a paradigm shift in in uh, image uh, recognition networks. But um, but the big jump in deep learning. Uh, came uh, in, in neural networks came before that, if I'm not wrong, and uh, kind of coincided with the time when we were preparing for Higgs discovery. But uh, Higgs discovery was heavily dependent on uh, boosted decision tree based right. techniques. Um, yeah. Were we uh, looking back, were we the most optimal and uh, why? Why did we not explore deep networks more? Was it the machine power or? Uh... Yeah, it's an excellent question and uh, it would be work, uh, worth uh, pondering on it a lot. So the, <clears throat> the point is that uh, while the technology started to be available uh, many years before uh, we started to use it, uh, there is a, a, an inertia, a, a, a difficulty in, uh, in uh, using new methods in high uh, energy physics because, uh, because unfortunately the people that take decisions are not always the most informed ones uh, and those that actually understand uh, better the new technologies. This is, uh, this is something that has uh, plagued the physics research for over a century now. And uh, there is not much uh, to, to do about it. Uh, we always uh, are, there are people that are always trying to look forward and uh, at these uh, cutting edge new techniques. And uh, this, uh, this thing I was mentioning uh, may very well be the future, but very few people still realize it. And uh, therefore, you have to do a lot of education and uh, evangelization, and it takes time, and it's uh, unrewarding. I have uh, submitted uh, several grant applications with these ideas in mind, but people typically tend to, to, to believe that this is too far-fetched, or uh, you know, detector builders want to continue to be the ones that take the decisions. So <laughs> it is... Uh, uh, we are destined to have a lag, uh, and I don't see how we can uh, improve the situation much, except, uh, as I said, doing evangelization. But indeed, we can see this in the past, uh, and uh, not just with neural networks, but for sure. The first neural networks, uh, I, I mean, I was a graduate student, uh, undergraduate uh, in 1992, when people were already using neural networks in CDF to discriminate quarks from gluon jets. But it was not used in the end because people were not trusting their uh, their tools much enough. 
So I think uh, it, uh, it's a little, it comes little by little that we trust our methods and then we can do something more advanced. But well, thanks for the question. Uh, thank you, Kamasa, for, uh, thank you again. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, let's close the session now. Um, and, uh, if, but I guess then one take home message from the last answer is that we should have more sessions like this and try to, <laughs> try to educate the younger generation. Yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we look forward for more sessions from you. Um, and, uh, I'm we, always we happy to have... contribute. Thank you.